Welcome to HortTube. This is the December garden checklist video. We do one of these each month. Just going over the things we're doing here in our Raleigh, North Carolina garden. Uh, there's about three years of these now. And the very first one I ever did was much longer than the rest. And it was just anything and everything you might think about doing in a December garden. Kind of narrowed it down to what we're actually doing here in zone 7B, 8A, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, we're in a, uh, it's a small urban lot and we probably gain a couple degrees above the surrounding community. I used to have my nursery out uh, about 20 miles southeast of Raleigh, and despite being south and east where it should be warmer, it was actually normally two or three degrees cooler than it is in this garden on an ongoing basis. So we probably have a couple things pushing the boundaries here um, because we can, because of the asphalt and the asphalt jungle that we kind of live in. December is a great month here in the southeast to be planting, you know, fall and winter. The main thing is, is the plants need to be acclimated to your area and hardy, very hardy in your area. So I don't plant marginal things in the month of December. So I'm not going to put something that's just barely hardy in zone 7B in in December when I could buy it and then put it in a garage for the next two and a half months in and out. You know, when it's warm outside, have it outside cold nights have it inside and make sure that I get it through this next two and a half, three and a half months and then put it in the ground and not have wasted my time, money, and effort. Uh, but anything that is really hardy in your area, things that are dormant, uh, you know, trees, uh, bare root fruit trees, if you can find those, uh, anything that's at least one zone hardier than your area, anything that's been outside at the garden center for some period of time. So, it's basically experienced the exact same temperatures as your garden has at your house. So you're not bringing it from Alabama up to Virginia and then putting it in the ground and that plant from Alabama is more awake, you know, than it would have been otherwise. So that's something to think through. If it's, there's a lot of deals out there to be had and I would definitely grab them and I definitely put them in the ground. Just make sure they're hardy, you know, you know, hardier than your area actually when you're planting in December and uh, that they're not awake, <laughs> you know, that they're asleep like they should be. We are going to be, we took a two month trip out of town. And so what you're gonna see a little bit spot to spot as I move around in this video is it's very messy out here. We're coming back after two months, there's leaves everywhere. Edging needs to be done. We have annuals that were, uh, frost has killed them back and we haven't pulled them out of the ground yet. So we have major cleanup uh, to do out here in the garden. And I'll, we'll talk through that in this video. The other thing you'll find while you're shopping is there's probably very interesting, colorful conifers, colorful foliage plants that look great in the wintertime, like this golden Oakland Holland that's in, uh, holly that's in that container uh, right there. Uh, camellias, which are in bloom here in front of me. Uh, I put up a video right before this one on 10 things that are still flowering here in the garden after mid, several mid-20s uh, nights uh, over the last month, month and a half. Um, we still have things blooming and you'll you can run into those things when you're out shopping if you're in an area that's colder than ours you can do this with foliage color so you know d different chartreuse colors blue colors that kind of thing you can keep some winter interest in your garden normally by now i would have already planted snapdragons dianthus pansies that kind of thing we were out of town we are still going to do that so i'm going to go out uh, shopping in the next couple days and see if i can find some pansies uh, that look pretty good and those will be planted we also have a couple boxes of bulbs, and this is about the time we normally are sticking bulbs in the ground, maybe a little later than I normally stick most of them in the ground. But so you'll see that over the next few weeks. But if there's any deals to be had, you know, with bulbs that are remaining, annual, uh, winter annual plants, if you're in the south, uh, if those deals are out there, grab them for sure. And definitely be on the lookout for things that can make your garden more interesting through the winter months. Normally we have three rounds of vegetables in our vegetable garden here in Raleigh. I actually like to have the vegetables throughout the rest of the garden if I could, but this is the only spot here that's really sunny long enough during the day to produce peppers and tomatoes and some of the summer vegetables that really, really need a lot of sunlight in order to perform well. So, but this space, we normally, February, March, April, would be growing leafy greens, uh, lettuce and uh, some brassicas like broccoli, cauliflower, those kinds of things uh, in this space. And then we convert, it's, then it's a summer vegetable garden, you know, squash, zucchini, peppers, tomatoes, all those kinds of things, uh, beans. 
And then in the fall, we would come right back as the nighttime temperatures cool with more leafy greens, that kind of thing. But we knew we were gonna be out of town, so we didn't do that this year. We actually took all of our containers that we had uh, around the garden and planted the plants directly in the ground. The plants came out of the containers, didn't put the containers in the ground. That's a good way to drown your plants, um, is to contain that water in a container. So we basically just planted them uh, in this space to reuse them later. If your vegetable garden, uh, if you had a vegetable garden and you don't have anything in it now, so you didn't do any fall vegetables, get that space covered. Make sure you're protecting that soil life. The, bio, you know, the biology that you're developing in that garden by using compost and growing these things in it each year and using uh, organic fertilizers and that kind of thing. You can use your leaves to cover that space. Uh, during the winter time, you can use pine bark, you can use whatever you want to use, uh, organic material to use, and keep this space covered. So I, I planted these and then I spread some pine bark out in between them because that was kind of the easiest thing to kind of kick around the plants. Uh, it's fast and easy. But again, make sure this space is covered because I don't want it to go back to weeds. I don't want it to spend the winter with hen bit and chickweed and some of those winter weeds coming that are going to then throw out a million seeds that I'm going to have to battle winter after winter after winter. So keep it covered for several reasons. Protect that soil life, prevent weeds, have that space kind of ready to go again, whether you're planting cool season vegetables in the early spring or you're planting summer vegetables later on. Those of you in the deep south can, con can continue to grow your leafy green vegetables. This would be about the time limit for us right around the 1st of December. But what we do is we have a couple covers here that we can stretch out over those things. So if you still have lettuce growing, you know, a couple, if you can get it covered a couple of these mid 20 nights, sometimes you can extend it for several weeks. I also like to grow some of those leafy green vegetables in little bowls. So a little plastic pot container bowl or decorative pot, whatever you want to use, so that you can move them in and out. Uh, and you can actually keep some of those things growing throughout the winter. I'll probably show that in some upcoming videos uh, in the future. Let's talk about some of the maintenance things in the garden. And this is a pretty, you know, this is a list that we talk about watering, fertilizing, pruning, mulching, all of those kinds of things and how I think about it uh, on a monthly basis. So here in December, uh, we'll have some, some of our, you know, annuals have been killed back to the ground uh, down here along the front border. And again, we would have already erased these if we had been in town. So they, these are gonna come out quickly. We'll just bring a wheelbarrow around here, take out any annual plant or plant that was grown to be an annual, meaning we only expected it to be in the ground for a season uh, and we were pulling it out. A lot of this stuff we start from seed. You can follow along with the channel uh, for that to save a little bit of money. Uh, we'll talk about, more about seed in just a minute. This, uh, so this stuff will come out our native perennials, we typically leave standing uh, in, the, in the garden. They're not the most attractive things, but things like black-eyed Susans, coneflowers, joe pie weed, uh, liatris, a uh, few other things. Some of those stems are hollow and allow for some of our native pollinators to overwinter in our native plants. Our non-native perennials, salvias, things like that, things that aren't from this area, we'll go ahead and cut those to the ground as they fade away. So things like my lantana out in the front garden, best time to prune it's in late winter, but it's so unattractive through the winter out there. And it's such a high profile space out in the front garden. I'm gonna chop it to the ground. It'll come back without any problem. Some of my salvias and other things, we'll go ahead and cut those down, neaten up the garden. There will be a couple of places that aren't the neatest. It's just a decision we made to leave those native perennials standing through the winter time. All, almost all other pruning you might want to do outside of pruning off a crazy limb. I get questions all the time. I got a crazy limb on something. Cut that thing off, okay, and move on, and move on with your day. But if you're doing whatever general pruning you need to do, most of it either takes place in the late winter or after that plant flowers. Okay, so as an example of that, this loripedalum beside me is one of the earliest flowering plants in the garden. And it will bloom as early as mid-February, depending on soil temperatures and, and nighttime temperatures. If we get a few nighttime temperatures up in the 50s, this thing will automatically start blooming. If I cut it now, I'll be taking out a lot of those flowers. So this is these early flowering things, I don't prune them until after they flower in the early spring. There's an azalea down below me right here. This is a uh, uh, autumn, is it autumn lily, I think? Is this one? Uh, uh, autumn lily encore azalea. It's, already, it's bloomed in the fall and it's already set flower buds 
for March or April, you know, again, depending on our weather outside. After that is when I would give it a haircut if it needs it. You kind of need to know the plants you have if you're thinking about doing any pruning in the, uh, in the late winter. Those, again, those early spring flowering things, you don't prune them until after they flower. The summer flowering things, the perennials, those kinds of things, you prune those in the late winter uh, typically. So again, follow along with the channel. I have an entire playlist, and if you go to the main page on our YouTube channel here, it's, there's a tab that says playlist. Okay, there's, I have divided these 1,500 videos that I've done over six years into playlists, and there's a playlist for pruning. And so if you want to learn more about, you know, when to cut something, when to not cut something, because not, when to not cut it is probably more important than when to cut it sometimes, uh, you can go through that playlist and see some of those videos. This Marvel Mahoney is definitely an example of something that, if you were shopping right now, would be a plant that you would think about adding to your garden if you're in an area where it will grow. This is, I think these are hardy in six to, zone six to nine, possibly 10, but I know six to nine uh, for sure. Uh, it's a great winter, you know, great winter interest plant uh, out here in the garden. It's a little prickly, but you don't, you don't need to hug it, you know. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, you never really need to touch it, so it's not that, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, just a great flowering plant. Uh, through the month of December, I have a series of videos called the Learn to Garden Video Series. It's over on my website, horttube.com. There's a $60 discount for the month of December. The code is DEC60, capital DEC60, just DEC for December. But this, this is the biggest discount I've given off of the Learn to Garden Video Series. Once you buy it, you own it, all the video content that's there, and I'm going to be continuing to add to it through the entire year of 2024. So there'll be more and more content. Again, once you own it, you have it. The other maintenance things that we have going on uh, in the garden, number one is there are leaves everywhere out here. We got a big giant white oak back here that drops lots and lots of leaves, and it drops them too thick uh, back in this garden space. So we'll go, I'll go through here with a rake, thin these leaves out, actually take them down to the driveway. There's gonna be a video coming up about that. I'll break them down some and I'll reuse them out here uh, in the garden, uh, but a little bit thinner than they are. Very important to keep the ground covered during the winter time, whether that's the leaves, whether that's hardwood mulch, pine straw, uh, hay bales, whatever the heck it is, keeping it, that mulch for winter time, and there's a lot of reasons we mulch, and I've you know gone through this list many many times. But in the winter time, it's, just, it's very important because it moderates the soil temperature uh, throughout the winter, keeps the roots a little warmer on your plants than it normally would be. And the winter weeds can be just as bad as the summer weeds. They're germinating during the fall. They're just kind of sitting there, and then they ex absolutely explode in February and March, and can make your beds look terrible. Your lawn, your beds, everything. Um, you know, hen bit, chickweed, and some other uh, winter winter weeds uh, that we call them. The next thing on the maintenance list is water, uh, and it's been abnormally dry throughout the fall here. We've gotten a little bit of rain, and I can see some moisture here, but I'm actually seeing some of the plants that we planted over in the vegetable garden look dry to me, and a couple of the conifers have thinned some from the bottom. They're browning out in the interior. I've got a couple of zellias back here that are dropping more. They always drop a few leaves this time of year. They're dropping way more than they normally would. So I know it's still dry out here. I don't think we've gotten enough rain to actually saturate the soil. We're making this trip across the country. The Mississippi River's low. Every lake we've been by is low. It's really dry here. I don't know how it is in the rest of the country for the rest of you, but I know the southeast is dry, way drier than it should be. And so I'm probably going to water a few things if we don't get some rain here uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few days. Water goes a lot further this time of year, so you don't have to be watering constantly, but uh, you do need to be thinking about it. Uh, and, and what we'll do is water something thoroughly, and rather than needing to think about it a day or two later like you would during the summertime, you know, you can go several weeks uh, after watering. But I think there are some things in this garden for the first time ever that may end up needing water here in the month of December. We had planted all of our container plants into the ground over there, but normally we have things in containers through the winter. Those are definitely something you need to check on uh, during the winter time for water. Uh, and when the plants are frozen solid, when the pot's frozen solid, which will definitely happen here uh, during the winter time, on any given night that's in the mid 20s, that pot will freeze all the way through. There's no water available for that plant uh, in that container. So keep that in mind. If that plant in your container is not extremely hardy, 
uh, in your area, like substantially hardier than your area, a couple zones hardier than, um, if it stays frozen for any length of time, it's gonna be in trouble. So you might wanna put some of those things in the garage uh, on nights where the pot can freeze solid. Okay, one of the things we are also on the scouting for as we're back is just invasive uh, weeds. We have ivy uh, on the neighboring properties and that seed gets spread over here. So we're constantly fighting Ligustrum ivy invasive plants uh, in this garden. Um, most of our, you, if you, as you look around, we've been gone for two months, you're not seeing any of the just kind of random weeds uh, that you would normally see. Again, that mulch cap is protecting all that, but it doesn't do anything for these seeds that these birds drop out here in the garden from, uh, from these invasive plants. So when, when things die back to the ground, when they're dormant, when they've lost their leaves, and you can see the ground a little better, you can get in here and uh, really work on these uh, getting these invasive plants out before they have a chance to really establish themselves. That was really easy to pull out, especially this time of year because the ground is a little moist uh, and it pops right out of the ground pretty easily. And I just, there it is, it's mulch. <laughs> it's, it's mulch now, as long as it doesn't get covered up and root back in. Uh, the other thing is fertilizing. I'm gonna get lots of questions about fertilizer all the time. Um, I've always said that I think overall uh, we're asked we're asked by fertilizer manufacturers to fertilize way more than we need to. And then in general, we live in a copy and paste world. And if somebody reads you need to fertilize something three times a year, four times a year, it gets copied and pasted a lot. And that's where, um, we, where we are mentally is lots of people think that, this is, that these plants need us way more than we you know, when they actually do. What they need is for us to keep the ground covered, keep the moisture kind of even, you know, throughout the season and get the heck out of their way. <laughs> that's actually what they, that's actually what most of these plants need from us. I do fertilize once a year. You'll see that in February or March. I almost fertilize just to show how little I fertilize uh, during the year. Uh, pretty much every bit of growth um, that you guys have seen in this garden over the last three years has all been done by beneficial fungi, beneficial bacteria, breaking mulch down, and also making nutrients available from our clay-based soil here in Raleigh, which is actually very nutrient rich. Uh, and uh, the garden just exploded from that with very little fertilizer. So there is some fertilizing to be done, uh, but it's, you know, it's very, it's way, way, way less than anybody would ever recommend on a bag to you. And you'll see that in February and March, but no fertilizing during December. We wouldn't want to be pushing any growth that could be burned by winter, by winter cold. So gardening is a set of rules and then a list of exceptions because that's always <laughs> that's always the thing that's always the thing. It's always like all of those do this except for that one, and then that one needs something different. So my fertilizing rule uh, about not fertilizing this time of year: if you have leafy green vegetables and you're trying to get some growth out of them before the end of the season, like lettuce uh, or some you know something like that, or when I plant pansies in the next week or so, I may add a little bit of fertilizer to those because I am trying to get those things to put on a little bit of growth or at least establish a, a, a good root system. So as it warms up in February and March, those, the, the top part of the plant can really kind of explode. So more pushing roots than anything else, but there is an exception. I will be fertilizing <laughs> during the month of December uh, pansies uh, and snapdragons if I end up putting any uh, snapdragons in. If you haven't pulled up any of those kind of tropical bulbs that um, need to be lifted in your area, uh, definitely still want to do that. So things like elephant ears, calla lilies, um, dahlias, and that kind of depends on where you live. Each of these things have a different hardiness. So for us, you know, dahlias are typically hardy in the ground zone eight to 10 reliably. In seven B, you know, where we kind of are, uh, we'll lose potentially a couple of them during the winter time by leaving them in the ground. Lots of videos on YouTube about lifting those things out of the ground and storing them through the winter time. Uh, we leave ours in the ground. Uh, I, I know I'll lose a few of the dahlias that we have out here, but we collect seed on dahlias and we redo some each season. So I'll just fill the gaps with those seeds. The other thing about leaves, I've talked about leaving the leaves on the ground uh, in your beds. Obviously we don't leave them on the lawn. So, you know, they need to be raked off the lawns. Gutters need to be cleaned out. There's just general maintenance like that, that I, I need to do out here to get those things you know, get this all cleaned back up because it looks like a mess out here. Underneath this is a beautiful garden, but it definitely looks like a mess. And so that's, 
I think overall the biggest thing in December is doing maintenance and doing planning uh, and getting yourself prepared uh, for the spring season. Uh, and also, if you have any kind of hardscape projects, patios, walls, fences, those kinds of things, it's certainly easier to put on layers and go out and work in the cold than it is in the heat of the summer when it's, you know, flat out dangerous, when it's 95 degrees outside sometimes. Part of this early December planning uh, that I'm talking about is making sure that hoses aren't going to freeze, you know, disconnecting hoses from the house. I'll pull out my lawnmower and change the oil in it, get the blade sharpened on it or sharpen it myself, uh, do some of that tool maintenance, just being ready, you know, being ready for spring to come back around. I'm also gonna be ready for the worst of the winter temperatures. I don't care what the new zone map says about what zone you're now in. <laughs> the, the zone map is an average low temperature, okay? So you can have the coldest winter in a century uh, in a 10 year span and then have nine warm winters and end up with the zone map saying that you're in a slightly warmer area, okay? But that one winter that was the coldest winter in 100 years could have killed lots of the plants in your garden. So keep that in mind that, that again, I don't care what that zone map is telling you about your new, I'm now in zone 8A instead of 7B and I can grow all these zone 8 things. You need to be prepared to cover those things, okay? So the things that we're pushing the limits on out here, I have enough sheets, blankets, towels, pillowcases, uh, shade protection, um, frost protection blankets. We have a whole stack of stuff out here in the shed that we can pull out at any given time if we get an abnormally cold night. So as long as my nights are you know, above 15 degrees or so uh, Fahrenheit here in Raleigh, everything in this garden will be pretty much fine. Once it starts to drop below that, I have some, th I know the plants out here that I'm pushing the boundaries on and we have covers for those. One of the biggest planting things we have to do right now is seed. We do a lot of the annuals from seed, the flowering annuals from seed and all of, also our vegetable garden from seed. We haven't done our seed shopping like we have in the past and so I need to gather those things up because February will be February and March will be starting lots of things from seed if you're following along uh, with the channel. Saves a lot of money and we can really go all in on so much color out here in the garden and not you know not again not break the bank uh, not break the bank break the bank doing that uh, easy for me to say. We did a video on um, earlier this year on tools we couldn't live without. So Steph showed the tools that she likes to garden with and I showed the tools that I like to garden with. I'm gonna link that video down below. You can go back and watch that. So if you're giving gifts and you're, if you're a man and you're giving gifts to a woman or wife or girlfriend or whatever, um, or a woman giving them to a man, maybe you can see the difference in the tools that we could use uh, in the garden physically. Uh, use uh, in the garden and then those tools are linked down below that if you're interested in those. If you want to give the Learn to Garden video series as a gift, you can just sign up for it under your email address and then uh, it allows you to change the email address uh, after you've given it as a gift so that person can log in uh, to it in the future. So uh, thank you for considering the Learn to Garden video series and thank you for following along with the channel. And if you're following the channel, you can see us during the month of December doing a lot of the things that I just talked about in this video. Thanks for watching.